it's Let's Chat and it's wonderful to be with you again this Wednesday morning and I'm going to be talking about meeting Jesus at the well but let's open in prayer and trust in God for great revelation for everyone today. Jesus thank you so much for the privilege once again of being able to share your words so freely of being able to love you, to worship you, to love each other, to care about each other, and to see the glory of God manifest in our time and in our country in a time such as this. I am so aware, Jesus, that you've got your hand beautifully on South Africa. Even though we can't see it, even though we don't understand it, it's darkest just before the dawn, and you have got a new dawn for South Africa. But you're calling your church to rise up and to take her rightful place. And so today, in the name of Jesus, we just come and share your word, and I pray that I can inspire, and I pray that I can turn hearts towards you at a greater level, and I pray for revelation, great revelation, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning, folks. Let's chat. Meeting Jesus at the well, and I'm going to be reading quite a lot of chunky scripture to you today, from John 4 and John 5. I find it very interesting that there are two stories right next to each other of people meeting Jesus at a well, a pool, a spring, and the way that they responded to that, and the response that he wants us to have when we come and meet him at the well. Well, I'm going to be reading to you from John 4 and John 5, and if you look at John 4, if you've got a Bible, please turn to it. If you haven't, just listen, and I'll try and read it as, as clearly as I can. And I'm going to read to you from John 4, verse 4 to 30, chunky scripture. And this is where Jesus meets the Samarian woman at the well. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Remember, Joseph was Jacob's favorite son, and he had given him this plot of land. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour when a Samarian woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? Now, what we need to understand was this was incredibly unusual because she was a Sumerian and she was a woman. Now, since 1 Kings 12 in the Old Testament, Israel had divided into two nations. Israel consisting of the 10 tribes and Judah consisting of two tribes. Now, we know that Jesus came as a lion in the tribe of Judah, and so those were made up of two tribes while the others were ten. There was great animosity between the tribes of Judah and the tribes of Israel. The Jews and the Israelites became greatly divided. And then after the fall of Israel to the Assyrians, they began to intermarry with the Assyrians. So we see that Israel and Judah were two kingdoms. Israel was defeated by the Assyrians. They started intermarrying with the Assyrians, which was against the word of God, which God said they were not to do. And because of this, the Jews hated them, calling them half-breeds or dogs. And the Jews would not associate with the Sumerians. They saw themselves as being superior or more pure than the Sumerians were, and they would have nothing to do with them. So here's Jesus at the well, Jacob's well, and Jacob's well means spring or fountain, Samaria means a watchtower, a watch station, or guardian. And so we see that Samarian being the watchtower or the watchman on the wall, and Jacob's well, meaning a fountain, was where Jesus met the Samarian woman. Now, I said to you last week or a few weeks ago that men were not allowed to talk to women in public. And so here Jesus is addressing a Samarian asking for a favor, and that was an absolute no-no. And what's more, she was a woman. No wonder she was incredibly surprised by his request. The disciples had gone into town to buy food. The, um, the, Sumerian, oh, I'm so sorry. the Sumerian woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan, a woman who, who, how can you ask me for a drink? For the Jews did not associate with the Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you know the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him 
that he would have given you living waters. So Jesus says to her, I am the living waters. And if you knew who was asking you for a drink, you would have asked of me. So the woman said, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and who drank from it himself? As did also his sons and the flocks and the herds? And Jesus answered her, Anyone who drinks from this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks from the water I will give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I will give him become a spring of living waters within him, welling up to eternity. And the water that Jesus gives us is the water of the Holy Spirit. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. She still didn't see the reality of the living waters and the water, the physical water, but she wanted it. She was eager. She wanted what Jesus had. He told her, go, call your husband and come back. Now, when Jesus said this to her, he was testing her heart. You know, Jesus will often ask us a question, but he asks because he's testing our heart. Will we answer him honestly? Will we take responsibility for our actions? Or will we blame shift just the way that God spoke to Adam and Eve? And he asked them a question and we know they, they blame shift. They did not take responsibility for themselves. So he says to this woman, go and call your husband. But she immediately takes responsibility. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus answered her, you are right when you say you have no husband. And the fact is that you have had five husbands and the man that you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. So Jesus tested her. He tested her to see if she was going to be honest, if she was going to take responsibility because he already had the word of knowledge. He already knew that this woman was not married to the man that she was living with. Now, friends, this is a really important point. I've had so many Christians say to me, oh, but you know what? We don't have to be married legally in the law because we're under grace. We can just be married in God and we can live together. Friends, Jesus said to the woman, the man you're living with is not your husband, but you've already had five husbands. Now, if Jesus says to the woman, you are with somebody now, but he is not your husband, even though you're living together as man and wife, You've had five, but this one is not your husband. Then I want to say to you, do not be deceived. If you are not married, you cannot expect the blessing of marriage on a relationship that you're living together. No matter how you justify it, no matter how you look at it, no matter how you try and silence your own conscience, and no matter how many other people you convince that we are living together under God. No, you're not. You're sinning. And Jesus tested her in her area of sin. And she was honest and she spoke the truth. No, I don't have a husband, she said. And he said, yes, because the man you're with right now is not your husband, but you've had five others. He tested her and she passed the test. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. So she say, you're a prophet, but I don't understand this. This is where our fathers have always worshipped. But the Jews say the place of worship is Jerusalem. And so therefore we are wrong to worship here. And that's the right place. Um, Jesus declared, believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the father neither on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshippers the Father is seeking. Friends, religion said you have to be in this position to be worshipping God. The Samaritans believed that they needed to be on the mountain of, Je of, of the, the guardian mountain or the watch mountain that was the place that Jacob had given to Joseph. And the Jews believed it had to be in Jerusalem. And Jesus says the time is coming and has now come where true worshippers will worship him in spirit and in truth. 
Because friends, when the living waters is within you and it's bubbling up like a brook of life, where you are, he is. You carry the presence of God. You carry the glory. You carry revival. You carry it. And wherever you are, and as you worship in spirit and in truth, it means you worship with all of your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. And your spirit connects with the spirit of God. And there is an encounter of presence. He said, now is the time that you are enabled to do that. You're entitled to do that because I'm giving you living waters. I have come to give you living waters. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. Friends, we are not Christians because we go to church. We're Christians because we know how to worship God, because we follow him, because his living waters is within us, because we live in the very life of the living waters of Jesus. <coughs> the woman said, I know that the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, will he, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared to her, I who speaks to you am he. Excuse me. <coughs> so she knew the Messiah would explain everything. She knew. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. She knew he was coming and she was expectant of it. She was waiting for him. And we know that the Messiah is coming. And Jesus said, I am he who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking to a woman. But no one said, what do you want or why are you talking to her? I think by then they'd realized you don't ask Jesus questions. Because every time they had before, he had said, leave the children, let them come to me. He'd stop them. <coughs> from behaving in ways that were not according to the will of God. Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come, see, I've met a man who told me everything I've ever done. Could this be the Christ? They came out to the town and they made their way toward him. Verse 39, many of the Samaritans from the, that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I've ever done. And when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you've said. But now we have heard for ourselves and we know this man truly is the savior of the world. Friends, here is a woman who went to the well to go and drink. She had her own bucket. She had her own way of being able to receive from the waters of the well. Jesus is sitting there. She's a rejected nation. She's a rejected person. She was, Samaria, Samaria was rejected, but women were even more rejected. She is full of rejection and, dis, and, and acceptance. She's had five husbands, and now she's living with a man who's not her husband. She has been abandoned and rejected by men all of her life. And here Jesus comes to her and he says, I am the living waters. If you drink from me, you will never thirst again. And she says, I want that. I want that. Then I don't have to come here and draw water. But the moment that she had the revelation that Jesus was there to give her something far deeper, he was there to give her a spiritual revelation that worship was within her. When he said to her, true worshipers will worship me in spirit and truth. She said, I want that. And friends, she dropped her bucket she dropped the means of being able to feed herself and to strive for that which she wanted she dropped it she said that is not what i need anymore and she ran into the city and she told everybody i met a prophet who told me everything about myself no he didn't he told her she'd been married before he gave her a word of knowledge but because of that she felt as if he knew her intimately and he did know her intimately, but he'd only told her about her marriages. 
and she told everybody she met. She was so excited by the living waters that she had found that she didn't keep it to herself. She just told everybody she met, I've, I've met my Savior. I've met the one I've been looking for. I've been filled with living waters. I have now been, my past has been revealed. I have no shame. I've got nothing to hide. I am free and it's the most exciting thing. And she just told everybody. And I'm, I'm quoting some of the things that might not be in the word, but that was the attitude. I have found the, my, my Savior. I've met the one. Come, 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 come and see him. And she led them to the well, friends. And when they met Jesus at the well and they invited him to stay with them, they said, we don't believe anymore just because of what you've said. We now believe because of our own revelation, because of what we've discovered because of what we've received. And friends, that's what meeting Jesus at the well of life means. He comes to meet whoever he can. It doesn't matter where you've come from. It doesn't matter how rejected you've been. It doesn't matter how badly you've been treated. It doesn't matter what's happened in your life. He doesn't care, but he wants honesty and he wants you to take responsibility and he wants you to own that which has been wrong in your life. And then he says, I'm going to give you living waters. And he just floods us with the living waters, with the Holy Spirit of life. And we can never be the same again. That woman could never be the same again. She would found the lover of her soul. And friends, the overwhelming revelation of the, our first love for Jesus and the revelation of meeting the lover of our soul is that we cannot keep quiet about it. It's the most wonderful thing. You just want to share it with everybody. You want everybody to know about this amazing God you found, this amazing Savior that you've encountered. And friends, Jesus is still meeting people at the well. He's still meeting people in the place where they go to drink. He's still meeting people where they are desperate for more of him. And she said, we meet here, but they tell us the right thing is to meet in Jerusalem. And friends, I want to say to you, Jesus doesn't care where you are. When you are thirsty for more of him, he will meet you where you are at. It's not about being in the right building. It's not about being on the right mountain. It's not about being in the right atmosphere. It's about being desperate for more of him, friends. That's what it's all about. Well, the next thing, he goes to Jerusalem, the very place that she said that they had to worship. And I'm now going to read to you from John 5. Then sometime later, Jesus went to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews. Now here in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, was a pool which in Aramaic is called Bethsaida, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. So now Jesus goes to Jerusalem to another pool. He goes, first of all, to Samaria, to the pool at Jacob's well, to the fountain, the, the spring of, of water. And now he goes to Bethsaida. And Bethsaida means a house of mercy or flowing waters. And he goes there. And there he meets a whole lot of paralyzed, invalid, lame people. Some of the Bibles say impotent people, which means weak, feeble, and diseased. Blind people, physically, mentally, and spiritually blind, according to the concordance. Maimed people, limping and crippled. And he finds them all lying around this pool. And then uh, verse 4, which the NIV unfortunately leaves out, says this. For an angel of the Lord went down at appointed seasons into the pool and moved and stirred up the water. Whenever then the first after the stirring up of the water stepped in, was cured of whatever disease which he had been afflicted. And so what happened was that they had this pool in Jerusalem and all the broken people used to hang around there and then they used to wait for the stirring up of the waters, friends. And when the waters were stirred up, the first one into the waters got totally healed. And people used to die there, lie there day after day after day waiting for the angel to stir up the water. Now, angel, the word angel, according to G32, means a messenger from God, a pastor, or an angel. So they waited 
for this angel to stir up the water. Now, friends, that's exactly what happens when people come to church. You see, Jesus went to the, to the gathering place in Samaria where people went to drink and he gave them the living waters. He in, they encountered Jesus and they got the truth of life and their lives were never the same again. And then he went to Jerusalem and he found the pool of water where people were gathering to come and receive. And friends, that's exactly what the church looks like today. The church is full of weak, feeble, diseased people, full of people that are physically and mentally and spiritually blind, full of people that are limping and crippled and maimed because of brokenness, because of hurt relationships, because of where they've been. And they're all waiting for a pastor or a messenger from God to stir up the waters so that they can come into healing, friends. And that's the state of the church today. Everybody's waiting for somebody to do it. That woman came with her own bucket to come and drink at that well. And when she met Jesus, she no longer relied on her own strength, but she ran. And she was so full of the joy and the fire and the life and the power of God that she evangelized the whole city. And here were people just like what we have every single day at church. And friends, the tragedy is... They're all waiting for somebody else to do it. They're all waiting. And they never change. They're there for years and years and years. They're weak. They're feeble. They're diseased. They never change their lifestyle. They never change the way they do things. They just hang around. And we call it church and we call them Christians. And then the world is so hurt and broken by broken Christians. Because they're no different from sinners. They're still in the fullness of their sin. They've never dealt with that which has been broken in their lives. And God is saying, I want to open your eyes. You see, he said he's come to heal the brokenhearted, to set the captives free. The God of this world has blinded the eyes of the unbelievers so they cannot see. And to release from prison those that are in darkness. That's what Jesus does, friends. But we can go to church week after week after week after week. And have no hunger, no thirst after righteousness. And have no desire to get into the water. Because friends, it, it takes getting into the water and getting the water into you. And be very happy because you know what? It's my pastor. I'm a victim. Nobody does anything for me. My pastor is terrible. The church is terrible. They don't care about me. The people are awful because I go there. No one even says hello to me. The worship sucks. We're all waiting for somebody to stir the waters, friends. But there's no desperate hunger and thirsting for the water. It's blame shifting. It's blaming the world. That's exactly what Adam and Eve did. And Jesus will test us in our heart attitude the way that he tested the Samaritan woman. Go call your husband. No, I don't have a husband. What you're speaking is the truth. And here we see him coming to this pool and, and the angel that comes and we know that that could be the, the, the pastor or a messenger of God or, or, or somebody that is full of God that is there to stir the water so that people can come into healing. But there's no hunger and there's no thirst. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus said to him lying there and learned that he'd been in that condition for such a long time, he said to him, do you want to be well? You know, friends, I, I always marvel at that question. Surely when a person has been sick for so long, they want to be well. The truth is Jesus knew the condition of his heart. He knew that he was a victim, that he was always blame shifting. It was always somebody else's problem. He didn't want to be well. Because while he was in the state he was, he got the attention he needed. And I want to tell you, friends, there are many, many people that enjoy and embrace their sickness and their misery and their blindness and their feebleness because they manipulate others to feel sorry for them. And they sit there day after day after day, woe is me, poor little me, feel sorry for me. And they're right next to the waters, but they don't get into the waters and they don't get the waters into them. And when Jesus said to a man who had been crippled for 38 years, do you want to get well? You know what, friends? If Jesus said to me, do you want to get well? I said, yes, I'm desperate. Just like that woman said, give me the water. I want it. Oh, well, I can't really. You know, it's not my fault. Oh, shame. Feel sorry for me. 
because there's never anybody here to help me get into the water. Friends, if you'd been in a situation for 38 years, he'd been lying next to the pool for 38 years. That pool was surrounded by five columns. Five is the number of grace and fruitfulness. Don't you think in 38 years he would have found a way to wiggle to the edge? So that when the stirring came, he would just go ploops and fall in. Don't you think in 38 years he could have found a way where there seemed to be no way? Don't you think in 38 years he could have said to somebody walking past, can you just lift me a little closer? He wasn't sitting in the same spot for 38 years. He was coming and going. Somebody was bringing him and bringing him back. And yet... He had not found a way in 38 years to help himself. That woman was walking with a bucket in her hand. She'd found a way to help herself. She took responsibility for her sin. And she was desperate. Give it to me. Give it to me. I want it. Here's a man for 38 years that had sat there feeling sorry for himself, doing nothing about his situation, just like a whole lot of others, waiting for somebody to take me closer and somebody to stir the waters and somebody to feel sorry for me because, oh, shame, poor little me. You know what, friends? Jesus did not rebuke the ones that were meant to stir the waters. He rebuked the man. Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirring. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, pick up your mat and walk. I love that about Jesus. He never strokes self-pity. He never goes, oh, shame, I feel so sorry for you. He just said, now do something. You do something. You pick up your mat and get up. At once the man was cured, he picked up his mat and he walked. Now friends, this is the other thing that I want you to see. The moment that we take responsibility for our deep desire to have more of Jesus, the, the moment we get up and walk, the moment we drink from that which is Jesus has got for us, the moment that we start operating in the revelation that there's more, there's much more, that there's such an anointing of the Holy Spirit, that we actually can come into wholeness and freedom, that we actually be, can become that which we were created to be. The very first thing that's going to come against us are religious spirits. And I want you to know this. Do not be put off when religious spirits try and stop you. They will give you all the reasons why you couldn't, you shouldn't, and you wouldn't. When the disciples came there, they immediately thought he shouldn't be talking to her. This is not right. Fortunately, they didn't say it. But their thinking was religious. And friends, when this man suddenly was in freedom and he could walk, I mean, what do you think happened when he suddenly t decided to actually do something? When, he, when Jesus said, pick up your man and walk, he could have said, oh, well, I can't. But somehow he made the decision to actually do something. And I want to say to you, if you're watching me today, you're not walking in the freedom of your liberty because you haven't done something. There's something you have to do. You've got to get up, pick up your misery mat and do what God's told you to do. That woman dropped her bucket and ran in the fullness of his water and changed the whole city with one encounter with Jesus. This man had had 38 years of encounters, 38 years of seasons. That means four times a year at least the waters had twirled and he was still in exactly the same place because he was feeling sorry for himself. So, um, so then let's carry on there. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and he walked. The day on which he, this took place was the Sabbath. And so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, this is the Sabbath and the law forbids you to carry your mat. The disciples wanted to say to Jesus, the law forbids you to speak to a Samaritan. The law forbids you to speak to a woman. But they kept quiet. But that religious spirit rose up within them. The Bible tells us that. 
this man gets healed and the Pharisees come to him and they say to him, the law forbids you to carry your mat on a Sunday. Now, friends, he's just been healed. He's been crippled for 38 years. You'd think that people were so excited for him, <clears throat> but they were not. They wanted him to stay crippled rather than walk in the miracle of his healing. And I want to tell you, friends, religious spirits are not excited for you when you get into freedom. They are not excited for you when you start operating in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. They will bring every legalistic law to stop you. Oh, but you may not. You haven't been to Bible school. Oh, but you may not. You're a woman. You're not allowed to preach. Oh, but you may not. You're too young. You're still a child. Oh, but you may not. You're too old. They will use every single thing against you. And so many people shrink back into that paralysis again because they've been addressed by a religious spirit. And I want to say to you, once you've encountered Jesus at the well, he encountered Jesus at the well. He was instantly healed because he chose to rise up. And I want to say to you, friends, rise up. Encounter Jesus. Receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Receive the fullness of the living waters. And don't allow any religious spirit to tell you you can't do. The worst thing that happens to a young, zealous, on fire Christian is that they meet all dried up, grumbling Christians. And I want to say to you, friends, I had that encounter as a young Christian. Praise God, I pushed through that. Don't you dare allow a prune, a dried up old prune, a religious spirit who lost their own journey because they would not allow healing to stop you from walking in the authority and the fire and the glory of encountering Jesus at the well. We don't have an encounter with Jesus and stay the same. If you do, then you go back to being impotent, blind, and maimed. And the church is full of it. The church is full of crippled Christians, blind Christians who cannot see the signs of the times. They cannot even see what the enemy is doing. They don't even realize the urgency of the hour. It's just like the days of Noah. Any old thing we carry on carrying on. Meantime, the waters are about to break. The floods are about to happen. There's an incredible shaking and stirring in the heavens. The enemy is trying his utmost to take control of the world. And friends, the blind Christians cannot see it. They're going on as if nothing has changed. The religious spirits cannot see it. People are feeble. They're diseased. There are more Christians on drugs and antidepressants and sleeping tablets and you name it. That there are those in the world and we have a savior. We have glory. We have power. We have every single thing we need. Why? Because they've never got into the water. They've been sitting on the banks of the river for years and years and years, listening to purity being vomited from the pulpit, but they've never got into stirring waters where the glory is, where the power is, where the miraculous is, where the fullness of God is. And they sit there, miserable, full of self-pity, waiting for somebody. And I want to say to you, friends, stop it. Pick up your mat and get up. Arise and shine. And let the river of the living waters of Jesus fill you. And get into the fire. Get into the glory. Get into that which he has got for you. That man could have maneuvered himself to the end without any effort. In 38 years, if he was desperate, he could have found a way. He wasn't desperate. That's the problem. And friends, we can be so compromised and so lulled by the devil to say that we're doing so good because we're sitting on the side of the river, of the water, of the pool. And Jesus is saying, I've given you everything. Get that water in you and you get into that water. That's your responsibility. It's not somebody else's responsibility to do that for you. It's your responsibility. Okay, let's see where we're going on now. The day on which um, was a Sabbath, and so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath, the law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, The man who made me well said, Pick up your mat and follow me. Friends, Jesus is going to tell you something that's going to offend religion all the time. And you've got to choose every time. What are you going to listen to? So they asked him, Who is this fellow who told you to pick up your mat? They still don't have a revelation. I've been healed. The man who healed me said, pick up your mat and follow me. Who's the man?
man that said, pick up your mat and walk. The man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to them, see, you are well again. Stop sinning or something much worse will happen to you. Friends, Jesus looked at the man sitting on the edge of the water for 38 years and he saw him as a sinner. That woman who'd lived with five men and was married five men and who was living with a sixth, who came from a half-breed nation, who was a woman that was second grade, Jesus saw her and, and commended her on being truthful. And this man he saw as a sinner. What was his sin? His sin was that he wasn't hungry. He wasn't desperate for more of God. His sin was that he saw himself as a victim. It was always somebody else's problem. Somebody needs to stir the waters. Somebody needs to get me to the edge. Somebody needs to put me in. You know, poor little me, it's not my fault. He was always blame shifting. He was not hungry. He was not thirsty. He was very, very happy to be in... <coughs> He was very happy to sit in his misery. Unfortunately, friends, that is such a truth for 90% of the church. You know, as somebody who's been in ministry a very long time, as somebody that's pastored three churches and many, many other people, <coughs> excuse me, As somebody that still travels from church to church encouraging churches and as somebody that counsels people almost every single day I want to say this to you most Christians do not want to change they are very very happy feeling sorry for themselves justifying their depression justifying the fact that they're feeble and weak justifying their unforgiveness justifying the fact that they are spiritually blind and cannot see justifying the fact that they're not hungering after the word they're not hungering after the spirit justifying the fact that they don't worship justifying the fact that nothing pertaining to the kingdom of heaven has made any influence in their lives yet they go to church week after week after week after week and nothing changes <coughs> They do not bring their children up in the way that they should go. They do not go into the workplace and come with an opposite spirit. They behave as the world does, if not worse. And then they blame everybody else. They offended with the church, offended with the pastor, offended with other Christians, offended with everybody. Because they haven't changed. Friends, bitterness is an issue of the heart. Feebleness, disease and weakness is an issue of the heart. Being blind is an issue of the heart. Limping because of bad relationships is an issue of the heart. And when Jesus said to this man, don't you want to be well? He made every excuse in the book why he should stay the way he is. And I want to say to you that unfortunately is the picture of what we see every single day. Jesus is not coming back for a broken church. He's coming back for a bride that's equally yoked with like him. It says in Ephesians, he's coming back for a bride without spot or blemish, without any wrinkle. He's coming back for a remnant. He's not coming back for those sitting on the edge, broken, hurting, and feeble. He's coming back for those that are full of his spirit, full of his word, that have drunk from the living waters, that are worshippers, that know how to worship him in spirit and truth, and that know how to get into the water that know how to go deeper in the river of Ezekiel. Friends, do not be fooled. Do not be deceived. He said, I wish you were either hot nor cold. But because you are neither, you're sitting on the side of a pool called mercy, among the five pillars called grace and fruitfulness. And you're feeling sorry for yourself. He said to the man, do not sin again, or something worse will happen to you. Do not go back to old worldly patterns. Do not go back to your self-pity, to your blame shifting. Do not go back to being lukewarm. But hold on to your first love 
or something worse will happen to you. What a waste of a life to spend our whole life sitting in church and still go to hell, friends. What a waste. Which meant that you did not live in the fullness of darkness, but you did not live in the fullness of light. You were lukewarm. And Jesus says, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. A rejected woman, desperate to drink, met Jesus, drank his water, threw down her own efforts, and changed the city. A man that was not desperate sat for 38 years in his misery. And when Jesus said, do you want to be healed? He still did not say yes. Friends, the hour is urgent. Jesus is coming back very soon. You just have to look around you at how deep the darkness is to know that Jesus is coming back very soon. Where are you positioned? Where are you positioned? Are you sitting on the banks, lukewarm, stroking your misery? Are you desperate for more? Matthew 5 verse 6 says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. Jesus is the living water's friends. He's sitting at a pool called mercy. He's waiting to pour everything out of you, everything out for you. He's saying, come and drink from me. Start worshipping. The Father is looking for worshippers who know how to worship him in spirit and truth. At Jacob's well, she said, this isn't acceptable. We need to get to Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, they were happy to sit next to the pool, but they never got into the pool. Religious spirits will always try and stop you, friends. Do not be fooled by religion, because religion has never been Jesus. Get into the water. Go and stir up the well for yourself. Drink the living waters. Get full of the living waters. Overflow with the living waters. Let the, your cup overflow with everything God is within you. Because the glory of Lord is within you. The life of Jesus is within you. The living waters is within you. The kingdom of heaven is within you. And then pour it out wherever you go so that other people's lives can never be the same again because they met you. Friends, when people meet you, they need to get a revelation of what transformed you. And then you lead them to the well where they can meet Jesus themselves. And then the day will come that they'll say, it started with you, but it's ended with my own revelation. How desperate are you? How hungry are you? The hour is urgent, friends. The hour is urgent. He's coming back for a bride without spot or wrinkle. He's coming back for a bride with which he's equally yoked. And he's given all of us incredible opportunity to come into wholeness. Don't blame other people for your misery. Look into the eyes of Jesus and say, I want the water you're talking about. God bless you, friends, and until we meet again, goodbye.